say is thank you Lord. Thank you Jesus. I'm just going to end with this one. Just one time. Amen. You are God from beginning to the end. There's no place for argument. Just one. Amen. Hallelujah. something about fasting um, you look at the book of Isaiah it talks about the fast that I have ordained and the Lord was speaking to me strongly about this during the fasting period about giving dealing our meat to the poor giving our food to the poor and to those who don't have and um, 
I got some really, really distressed calls and messages from a set of people who were desperately in need of food during the period of fasting. And uh, for some reason, we could not raise an offering during that period. Um, this is what I want us to do. I'm not asking you to go break your bank, but I want you to just think about the fact that it is a commandment from God that when you fast, you give your food to the poor. And um, I want us to raise an offering in the month of February, whatever you have. We're going to have a box in the back there. And um, we want to give it to two churches that have identified. One is in Nigeria and one is in Cameroon. I, I don't know the members per se of that church, but I got to know about the need for food. I'm, I'm not talking about people who don't have enough food. I'm talking about people who don't have anything. And I want us to sow. Amen? I want us to sow into their lives. It's part of our fasting. And henceforth, every time we have fasting period, we will sow um, food uh, into the lives of some people. And I believe that is the way you release your own blessings too. Yes, Amen. And uh, in the same light, I want us to be very careful with the way we waste food. Praise the Lord. I know we don't talk so much about this, but when I, when I just got a testimony of these people, real people, about how they're struggling just to have a meal. And I think of the way we buy food and waste it and throw it away. Yeah, it's your money. You bought it, you threw it away. But think about it. It's like you're cutting part of your life and throwing it in the trash. Because you work, you earn that money. So I want us to please as much as possible educate our children on not wasting food. Amen. Amen. It applies to every aspect of our lives. Don't buy clothes that you don't need. If you have clothes in your closet you're not using, either you go sell them to the thrift store or wherever they sell them, or you give them out to the poor. There are people who need clothes. And by the grace of God, this summer we'll do uh, uh, some clothes drives and collect clothes. I'm not talking about the, the, the junk that you have. If it's not what is befitting for somebody to wear, we don't want you to bring it here. Yes, sir. Put it in the junkyard. Yes, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I mean, it's so heavy on my spirit uh, when I see things like that. When I see that we waste food, we waste money that could be used to help some people who are genuinely in need. I mean, we talk about genuinely in need. I got a text a few minutes ago about uh, some lady who is breastfeeding and she has a, a six months old who is breastfeeding. She doesn't have food. The, she has another child of I don't know how many years and the whole family, they don't have food to eat. Amen? So please, when you're wasting food, you're wasting God's resources he has given you, know that it is a sin. There's some people who don't have who genuinely don't have. And may the Lord help us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Back from a retreat. Amen. Amen. I believe that we are on the fire. We are on fire for the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I want to just continue this morning with a few things which we looked at before going on the retreat. We've been talking about life of Moses, amen. We saw how Moses was born under very unfavorable circumstances, very unfavorable circumstances. Decree, a decree had gone out for him to be killed, for those who were males to be killed. And we said there is a systematic extinction or genocide being wrought on men, whether in the physical, especially in the spiritual. 
And that is why we need to pray. Pray for the men in this church. Amen. Amen. Pray for the teenagers. I, I was, uh, as a young man, a friend of mine, two days, uh, four days ago, his father died. He was on the way to a crusade. And he heard that his father died. He said, well, let me go and finish preaching the gospel. Then I will come and bury the dead. I mean, I was so touched with that. This, is, this makes you understand people who know what this gospel thing is all about. Hallelujah. He said his father is dead. Well, thank God for his father's life. But is he going to leave the living who don't know the Lord and drop a crusade that has been organized? Or go and sit down beside his father's corpse and be crying, oh, oh, oh. No, listen. There is a time for everything. Amen. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is more important than any other thing. Hallelujah. I love what Pastor Sibyl said. So you need to major in your Christian life and minor in what you went to the university to do. Talking to the young people. Hallelujah. And this young man, uh, Moses, had a call of God upon his life. And he felt it was time for him to pick up the call of God. But he did not understand how to do what God had called him to do. And that is why he needed to be instructed rightly. And God miraculously made it so that he would go to a priest in Midian where he would train in priestly work. Amen. And he stayed there for 40 years. The first 40 years of Moses, he is living like a prince of Egypt. He's got the best food. He's got the best servants. He's educated in the things of, 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 uh, of Egypt. And they are converting him and trying to make him an Egyptian. Thank you. Hallelujah. And that is what the system of the world does. Try to beat you out of your calling and who you are called to be. Listen to me. I am a certified motivational speaker, but one of the set of people I don't like to deal with are motivational speakers. Amen? Because they keep fooling people. Your purpose, your purpose. There is no other purpose apart from serving God. I listen to what I'm saying. I am a certified John Maxwell uh, coach and trainer. Amen? But listen to me, a lot of people are missing out in life because they keep talking about purpose everywhere and everybody comes up on social media talking about your purpose. All we like sheep have gone astray. Amen? And the Bible says he has laid upon him the chastisement of us all. And the only way you begin to understand your purpose, you can only know your purpose if you're born again. Hello? Don't say, well, my purpose was to build a school. Listen, if you build a school and go to hell, you've missed it. It's a missed, it's a life that is missed. Hallelujah. And therefore, a man only understands his real purpose in life when he has given his life to Christ and Christ begins to show him what he's called to do. There's a man called uh, uh, Paul in the Bible. And he thought his purpose was to go about and kill Christians and do all kinds of things. But when he met with Christ, he asked him, what will you have me do? What is the purpose of my life? Hallelujah. And so before you understand the purpose of your life, it has to be centered in Christ. Somebody say, it has to be centered in Christ. Hallelujah. I don't care whether you become the best doctor. That is not the purpose of God for you. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't care whether you're going to become the best engineer and you be the best philanthropist. Praise God. Hallelujah. There is one purpose. The Bible makes it very clear. There is one duty for man. It is to serve God and to keep his commandments. And until Moses got to the place where he understood and was able to take his passion for delivering the people and bury that passion in priestly work, understanding how to shepherd people, he would have taken his whole mindset of an Egyptian king 
thinking that that is the way he was going to deliver the people. But God had to take him and cleanse that zeal and passion. Don't talk about passion if you're not born again. Any passion that is not embedded, is not subjected to the will of God, is useless passion. It will only serve to aggrandize yourself and only serve to build the kingdom of darkness. And he spends this next 80, uh, 40 years of his life walking as a shepherd. His vision is dead. His vision is gone. He, he, he now is like a wannabe. And everybody looks at him and says, Oh, you, you're the guy who, who said you would deliver the people. But listen to me. When your vision seems dead, when your zeal, your ambition for what God has called you seems dead, you need the fire of God to ignite it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is why God brought him to a place where he got him into the fire. And that is why we're talking about fire. A lot of people have lost their zeal for God. A lot of people have lost their enthusiasm for the things of God. That is why in America today people don't go to church. They wake up on Sunday morning, they sleep, wake up, go to the restaurant, eat, and come back. And those who want to go play golf on Sunday, they go play golf and come back. But they still have their Christian names. You go to France, you ask somebody, are you a Christian? You say, yes, I'm a non-practicing Christian. I mean, it's so, it's, it's, it, 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 they just say it so clearly. Who said Christian? I say, we should create a non practicing just so normal that I'm a non-practicing. I'm just a nominal Christian. I don't practice Christianity anymore. I just have the name of a Christian. And a lot of us are gradually falling into such categories. A lot of people, for them coming to church twice a, a, a month or once a month, it's really a great achievement. Listen to me. Church has to be part and parcel of your life. You, when you wake up from Monday to Saturday, you should just be thinking about the day of worship. The day when you present yourself before the Lord. That is why every other thing around you, listen to me, especially for people who like organizing parties and throwing all kinds of things. When you do any program, any party, anything, that disrupts everybody's time of worship, know that you are committing a sin. I want us to understand this type of things. Because as a Christian, you should make sure that you organize anything you're organizing to free people to go and worship God. Because that is the very essence for which they live. And when you organize parties or whatever till 4 a.m., 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, you're causing people not to go worship God. That is why when I understood these principles, nothing, nothing I will do to disturb people from going to worship God. I remember a few years ago, my brother died. They called me at 6 a.m. I was planning to go to church. I'm not going to disrupt a church service because my brother died. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I went to church. Hallelujah. I ministered. I went back home and I cried my lungs out. Hallelujah. And Moses understood what it meant to get into that place of the fire of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And that is where the zeal for the things of God got resurrected. That is where his calling got birth again. I'm telling you some people in this house need to have their zeal for God rebirth. Some people need to have their calling reborn. Oh, maybe the fire has gone down. Maybe the zeal for God has gone down. You need to have a rebirth in your spirit. You need to have a rebirth to your vision to serve God. Don't think that it's all over. You think you may be already old. And, listen to me. At 80 years old, God calls Moses. This is a man who, in his youth, he knew that he was called to serve God. But the circumstances and situations around him did not permit him. But when he went through all this training, God now calls him and puts him through the fire. Listen to me, the first thing that happens to anyone who has been through the fire 
is that they understand and they see the holiness of God. He gets to a place where the bush is burning and it's not being consumed. And his attention is drawn. And he goes there. The first thing God tells him is take off your shoes for where you are standing is holy ground. There is no service to God. There is no purpose that can be accomplished when you live in sin. One of the things that will, you will realize when you come in contact with God is the holiness of God. That is why I find it so difficult to understand how somebody can be serving God, saying that they are serving God actively and actively living in sin. Don't just call it a weakness, no. Actively living in sin. Because the first thing that you encounter is the holiness of God. Not even the miracles of God. You first encounter the holiness of God. And God told him, take away your shoes. For where you are standing is holy ground. If you are going to serve God, the first thing you need to do is deal with the issue of sin in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because he is a holy God. The Bible says he is three times holy. The Bible says the, the, the angels, the, the, just the, the 420 uh, elders, they go around the throne and they cry, Holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Is that what we see? Is that what we go through? Do we see the holiness of God? In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, the Bible says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, amongst the God who is like, holy, who is like unto thee? Majestic in holiness, awesome and glorious in your deeds and in your wonders. Whenever you encounter God, the first thing you see is His holiness. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about uh, Isaiah. He said, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, and His train filled the temple. Beloved, we need to come to that point where we know that you cannot be somebody who has gotten the fire of God and you continue in sin he said shall we continue in sin that grace shall abound the answer was no hallelujah Amen. hallelujah Amen. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 he says and one cried unto another and said holy holy is the Lord God of hosts the earth is full of his glory John in the book of Revelation said this. He says that the four beasts had each of them six wings with which they covered their eyes from within and the rest not day and night saying holy, holy, holy Lord Almighty which was, who is and is to come. Hallelujah. Amen. My prayer is that as we catch this fire the fire of God who will understand the place of the holiness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Because to serve God truly, you need to walk in His holiness. Amen. Amen. Now I want to go quickly and uh, just throw these five points here. There are some five characteristics of somebody who has been in the fire. And let's look at it in the life of Moses. Moses gets into the fire. This is Moses who was running away from Pharaoh. But when the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of God Almighty, had consumed him, he became bold. Hallelujah. He had the boldness to declare the word of God. One of the things that characterizes a person who has been baptized of the Holy Ghost is that they have the boldness of God. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Can people see your boldness and know that you have been to a retreat? Can people see the boldness that you have in declaring the word of God? You know, a lot of Christians would duck their heads especially when controversial issues come up when it has to do with Christianity. Just go on social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and put up a story about 
the holiness of God. See how many Christians will even click like. No. They don't want to identify. They don't want to take part in anything that sounds or looks controversial. And that is what the world is teaching us. And the, the truth is that that is the way the world is suppressing Christians. But I love the boldness that some people stand up with. I love last Sunday when I was watching the Super Bowl. And when some believers came up on the center stage. And when they asked the, 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 the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. He says the first thing he wants to do is give praise to Jesus Christ. His Lord and his Savior. And teammate after teammate, they came and they spoke about Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Do you know that after that, a lot of people began to come out of their homes? We have to understand that you have to be bold about who you know and who you serve. And some people went on to castigate them for trying to make the NFL a religious thing. And uh, what's his name? Coach Dungy, right? Dungy. Former coach of the Denver Broncos, was, was, was being lambasted because he said something. He said there was something about the faith of the quarterback of the, super, uh, of the, uh, of the Eagles. He said there's something about him, about his faith, that will keep him going on and on. And they began to castigate him. He said, why should he talk about the faith? Why? Now, listen to me. As a Christian, you've got to be bold. There is a battle that we are losing because we are not bold to declare who we are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts chapter 9 verse 29. The Bible says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. The disciples were now going about preaching the gospel. And it says, And behold their threatenings. And grant thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They were not asking for blessings. They were not asking for miracles. They were not asking for money. They were asking for boldness. When is the last time you went to a crusade and people were crying out for the spirit of boldness to just go and declare the word of God? Day in, day out, we pray for financial blessing. Day in, day out, we cry for money to fall down from heaven. Day in, day out, we cry, God, give me a husband, give me a wife, give me a new job. Listen to me. You don't need to pray to get a new job. Hallelujah. Sometimes if you have the qualifications and you apply, you will get the job. But there's something that you cannot get, that the world cannot give you, is the boldness to declare the word of God. Especially in the system and in the world like the one we live in today. You need the boldness to declare the word of God. Someone say, Lord, give me boldness. Lord, give me boldness. Hallelujah. In Acts, you see the same disciples. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says, And they and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah. Amen. They asked for boldness. They prayed. The place was shaken. When is the last time you prayed for thunder to come down so that you may have boldness to declare the word? Whenever you pray, I say, today, today, Jesus must answer me. We know that there's a financial request on the line. <laughs> Hallelujah. We know that there is something that has to do with money. We know that there is something that has to do with immigration. Today, today. Hallelujah. May God change our prayers. Amen. Listen, a lot of the things that we struggle for and we are asking it is not too difficult for God to give us. But because we are not asking the things that please God. We are not asking the things that will make his heart glad. We don't receive. We don't receive what God has already unleashed for us. Beloved, let us cry out for God to give us a spirit of boldness. That we may declare the word of God. 
when you meet in a gathering, declare that you're a Christian. Declare who you are in Christ. Yesterday I was privileged to be in a, a small, interesting gathering with some old school friends and people like that. And um, a lot of us just realized everybody was drinking, having a nice time. And I asked for water. That's all I'll drink. I said, I just want water. And they said, you got to pay before you drink water. Because all we have here is Shivas, um, what they have, vodka. I saw all types of vodka, I saw all types of drinks and wine. I said, I'm a Christian, I'm not going to drink. I drink only water, amen. And some people were wondering who is, oh, he's a pastor. I was not ashamed to declare I'm a pastor, amen. amen. Why are you ashamed to declare who you are? Why are we compromising? How can you be a Christian and you're compromising your stance as a child of God? I like the picture that Bishop McJones was painting. Jesus Christ who died for you, gave his whole life for you, and you're ashamed to say you're a Christian in front of people. Hallelujah. May the Lord have mercy on us. Hallelujah. And this man, Moses, was bold enough to return to a place where he knew that he could have been killed. Hallelujah. The next thing is that when you have gone through the fire, the purpose of God becomes first in your life. Listen to me. Whatsoever you do, you put God first. Amen? Amen. When, when you have the fire of God, Whatsoever you do in life, whether it is your education, whether it is your, uh, your job, whatsoever thing, God is first. Amen. Amen. God is first. Whether you're going to plan a party, you say, how will he glorify God? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because a lot of us, we party like devils and come to church and try to worship God like angels. Listen to me, it doesn't work that way. Hello? Whatsoever you're going to do, ask yourself, when I get my money, how do I spend this money? Does it glorify God? What is God's purpose for giving me this money? When you make your budget, is God first on your budget? Moses, his purpose as a deliverer was rekindled. He was now ready to go to a place where there were posters all over, wanted, dead or alive. He was ready. He was ready to go to such a place because he knew that the purpose of God was going to preserve his life. He was not afraid of Pharaoh anymore because he knew that he was in the center. Listen to me. When you are in the center of God's will, no devil, no demon can destroy you. Hallelujah. Praise God. The third thing I want us to understand is that when you are on fire for God, there is something about the knowledge of God. You know God. I ask myself if we come to church or do we come to fellowship with the Lord? Do you come to church? It's a good thing. Maybe you're scoring maybe one, two points for coming to church. But do you know him? Do you know God? Listen, Moses believed that he was going to deliver the people. Deliver them from where to where. He just knew that he had heard some stories that they were people of God. I knew that he was, he felt he could deliver them. But which God, when he began to interact with God in the fire, he knew who this God was. And now he knew that he was the I am, that I am. You see, when Moses went back to the people, he went back to his people, the people asked him, which God? Do you know the problem that they had? In, in distress, that they had forgotten the name of God. They did not even know who God was. 
They did not even know who he was or what God had ever said concerning them. Listen to me as a child of God who is on fire for God. You have a personal relationship with God. You know your own God. He's not the God of your fathers. He's not the God of your mother. He's not the God of your church. But he becomes your own God. Hallelujah. Amen. That is why in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 20. The disciples said. For we cannot but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. They were on fire for God. And they were saying, we are speaking about things that we have seen and heard. 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John was speaking. He said, that which we know, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, we want to pass on to you. You cannot pass on to somebody else a gospel that you don't know. Yes. Hello? If you don't know him, you cannot pass him on to other people. Hallelujah. It's one thing for you to know that the president of America is Barack Obama. But if you ask Michelle, do you know Barack Obama? She will tell you, I know him. He's my husband. And she will tell you secrets that you don't know about him. Because she knows him personally. But all you know is maybe some figure you've seen on television. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I, I want us to come to a point of a relationship. When you have a relationship with God, nobody needs to beat you and cajole you and tell you and try to, to force you into, into your Christian walk. Amen? Amen? Nobody needs to beat you to a pulp or try to form you into a, 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 a kind of person that you, you're not. When you know him, it makes a difference. Hallelujah. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 10 to 14. Paul was speaking to the Philippians. He knew God. He had this encounter with him. But there was a craving in his heart every day. He said, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. And if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He said, I want to know him. I want to have fellowship with him. I want to have that intimacy with him. When you've been through the fire and the fire of God is burning in you, you have fellowship. You have intimacy with him. You know him. You know who he is. You know when his feelings are hurt. Nobody will have to tell you, oh no, look, you're committing a sin. No. You, you, you know him. Because you know his feelings. You, you know how he will react. You don't want to hurt him. You know what to ask. And when he knows you, he knows what you're going through. He said, before you ask, he said, before, he said while you are still speaking, I will answer. Hallelujah. My prayer, my prayer is that we'll develop that kind of relationship. That kind of relationship with God. Hallelujah. The fourth point I want us to just take here is that when you have been baptized of the Holy Ghost, you develop a clear sense of hearing God's voice. Hello? A lot of times we say, I was going down the road and then something said, something said, I should turn to the right. Now, you know what people say something said? <laughs> because they don't know. They don't know him. And they don't know whether it was the voice of God or the voice of your human spirit or just by chance that they turned to the right 
And then they heard that the road on the other side was blocked. No, it's not something. You need to come to a point where you crave to know God so you can truly say, the Lord said, Amen. Hallelujah. Am I getting a witness in the house here? I want to lay this here because I don't want us to just run about and just say, oh, oh, thank God for the fire. No, I want you to develop a daily, we, we, we used to call that daily dynamic encounters with God. Where on a daily basis, you, 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 you commune with God. Where you refuse to leave your house until you have communed with God. Where when you're on the road, you commune with God. Do you commune with God? Do you just play music in your car just to boom the car? And maybe it's the music you're playing is not even the music that will help you commune with God. If you're coming out of a gangster rap car and you think that you come out of a car when you're playing gangster rap and you zoom into church. Now, that's why sometimes you got to beat up people and warm them up to a point where they can worship God. And when they leave, they go back and they have their ears all blocked with music that does not glorify God. Listen to me, the way you will listen to, you will know God's voice is because you get used to his voice. Are you used to God's voice? Are you listening to his voice? Moses could hear God speak to him and he would speak back to God. Oh, would to God that will come to such a point where you, where you will speak to God in the morning before you leave your house where you commune with God and God will speak to you and you will speak back to him on the road when you're driving your car when you get to your job wherever you go you will speak to him and he will speak to you Acts chapter 13 verse 2 says as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate unto me Paul and Barnabas the Holy Ghost said, they heard the voice of God. They heard the voice of God. When is the last time you heard the voice of God? When is the last time you could boldly say that the Lord told me? When is the last time? My prayers I will get back to such times. And you cannot get to such a place if you don't have time for God. The last thing I want to talk about here. Is that when you're being through the fire, you have a greater level of faith. Somebody say faith. 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 This is Moses, a man who is afraid of his life. But all of a sudden, he encounters God in the fire. He gets instructions from God. He talks with God. He now leaves that place. The first thing he does is he goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he says, I've been serving you for 40 years as a shepherd. It's over. Now, he's not even concerned about, are they going to give him a paycheck anymore? The purpose of God takes total control of his life. And he starts moving in faith, returning to a place where he knew that his life was at stake and he's going there with a message from God let my people go how was Pharaoh the king who was all powerful the most powerful man in those days how was he going to let them go I don't know but he knew that he was carrying a word from God that is the mark of people who know God and who have been through the fire. How is God going to do it? I don't know. But God said, and because he said it, I will obey. Hallelujah. And he moves on in faith and he goes to Pharaoh. He does not care how many, uh, what the number of his army is. He doesn't care if they're going to kill him the very next day. He goes and he speaks the word of God. Hallelujah. There's something about faith. 
Faith does not understand the whole journey. But faith stands on the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what the Bible says. By faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. There is no faith that does not stand on the word of God. And if you're going to be somebody who will walk in faith, you must stand on the word of God. Hallelujah. Do you have the word of God? Have you received a word from God? Do you read through the scriptures so that you can get a word from God? The reason why some people cannot express faith is because they don't have a word from God. Let me tell you something. The Bible is not the word of God. Oh, this may sound a little bit controversial. The Bible, from the etymology of it, is just a compilation of books. Amen. And there are 66 books, right? 27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old Testament. But these are books that went through some uh, canons to test to see whether they were truly ordained of God. But the word of God is what you read out of it and what God says to you from it. And many people have this copy of a book on their shelves, but they don't have the word of God. They have it in their phones. They don't have the word of God. They have it on their laptops. They don't have the word of God. They read it for political purposes. They don't have the word of God. Oh my God, when election is coming, every politician is going to church. They hold the Bible. It's one of the books that is most quoted. They have it everywhere they go. But it's one thing for you to have the word of God. Do you have the word of God? Beloved, I, I want us to be people who have the word of God. I want us to be people who don't just read. I mean, even reading it is, oh God have mercy. Reading it has become a problem. This is a generation that does not read the word of God. Whereas, it's so simple today. You can tell your phone to read the word of God for you. If you're tired, you don't, you don't want to read. You can tell Siri to read the word of God for you. You can tell Alexa to read the word of God for you. You can say, Alexa, read Matthew chapter 1. Alexa will start reading Matthew chapter 1 for you. You can buy a copy of whatever, even on your phone, plug it in your car and have it read to you. The word of God is being brought to us in every way. It's coming to us. We are rejecting it. We are pushing it away. The word of God is coming to us. Oh my God, this is a generation that is going to be one that will be cursed because the word of God has been made available in all kinds of ways. I, I, I said this with a lot of pain in my heart. Because when I, when I look at uh, the book, who wrote this book? Uh, Bible Smugglers. Who wrote that book? Right, but somebody you remember? Uh, just, you may want to Google it. How people used to smuggle Bibles in Eastern Europe, struggling to get Bibles. I remember this movie that we watched was by Christ for All Nations. How they, it was in Madagascar, true story, where they had one copy of the Bible and they had to cut it and distribute it to people and hide it so that you can read one portion and you hide it and get it to somebody else who could read it. I remember in that movie, this woman was actually burned alive. It was a true story, it was just acted. Burned alive, pregnant lady, because she read the word of God. The word of God is available to us today. Why not even spend extra time reading the word of God? I remember in those days when I was just calling my wife, amen. She would write a small piece of letter, I mean, and I'll read it until, and what are you reading in that letter? 
I'll read it in the morning, I'll read it in the afternoon, I'll flip it, I'll read it again, I'll read it upside down, I'll read it. What are you reading, Danny? One. Wow. Jesus loved her. Amen. And she wrote a letter. And I'm reading it. Oh, last week we went down and this is what happened. Then they said this. Oh, I miss you. When are you coming back? And then I read it over and over, over and over, over and over, over and over. And I'll be reading it and reading it until I fall asleep. Then I wake up in the night. I keep reading it. <laughs> I finish reading, I put it under my pillow, I sleep, I wake up, I read it, and I see, I, I see if there's something fresh in it. What else are you going to read in that? I mean, what else? And I have some of those letters. I mean, letters that were written some 27 years ago. I, I found one in my, in my basement already, and I was reading and I was so happy. When there's that relationship, there's that intimacy. When the fire of God is burning, the word of God is new, it's, it's made new every day. We say his mercies are new every day. I want you to just lift up your hand and say, God, in the name of Jesus, give me a new zeal for your word. A new love for your word, oh God. I want to love your word again. New love for your word. New love for your word. Somebody pray. Pray and ask God. Lord, I need, I need new love for your word. My, my, my prayer is that the things that we read every day will become truth in our lives. When he says in his word, I am the Lord that he led thee. It will not be a story. It will not be something that you write and put on the wall. Oh my God, somebody's not getting me yet. When he said in his word that I will be with you in trouble, you will know that any trouble you get into, you will get into it with him. And he will deliver you. It will not be something that you read somewhere. It will not be something that your pastor said. Because see, your pastor can tell a lie. Your father can tell a lie. But there is one who cannot lie. The Bible says by two immutable things by which it is impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. And therefore, if he said it, it must work. The fire you received has to continually be burning. We need him every day. Pastor just said, if we continue doing what we continue doing, it means no fire is in our life. Father, we bless our hearts before you this morning. Hearts of flesh. That your word be able to mire a little and change us into who we're supposed to be. That our purpose on the face of this earth is to know you and to serve you. That you died to draw us unto yourself. Spirit of the living God, you are in us to ignite us to that which you've called us to do. And so this morning I pray that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. Father, enlighten us spiritually in the name of Jesus. I come against all this head knowledge in the name of Jesus that we as people of God who are called by God enlighten us in the spirit. Thank you Lord this morning. Let's share the grace. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Bless you. Hallelujah. God bless I need you more.